considering the time that we have, we're going to, and I would ask the panelists to take notes because I'm going to combine the questions. We're not going one by yeah, one, yeah, yeah. but we're going to combine them. So microphones are on standby, I believe. Uh, Steve, why don't you go first? I'm going to come to all of you uh, and we're going to collect the questions and then I'm going to throw it back for one last um, Q&A session with the audience. Steve, go ahead. Ali, thank you, and thank you to the panel, which has been very good, by the way. Uh, I do want to throw it more to the future. Um, the war will eventually end. It will end in negotiations, but there is already disagreement in the alliance about how we treat Russia afterward. Do we have European security against Russia? Do we have European security with Russia? Do we have European security with America, though worried about China? The big question is, what happens to Russia after this war, which is a much more interesting question, frankly. Will it be a new time of troubles? Will it disintegrate? Uh, what will that do? Um, but mostly, I just want to get people to talk about how you look at Russia post-conflict mm -hmm. in relationship to European security and what kind of security guarantees can you provide Ukraine if, as Zaki Laidi says, outside NATO. I don't think they exist myself, but perhaps I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. A question we would be happy to incorporate. Uh, what does security with Russia look like afterwards? Uh, how does Russia look? What does uh, Russia look like? The microphone thing is being passed. We're, we're moving to both sides. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Hey. Bonjour, merci pour ce panel passionnant. Deux questions rapides. La première a été, euh, par sur la remarque de M. Sakilaïdi, euh, sur le réarmement européen. Est-il vraiment crédible au-delà de l'émotion que l'on a aujourd'hui, parce qu'on voit bien que, autant ou pas autant, il euh, n'y a aucun avenir dans notre relation à la, à la Russie sans une force militaire en Europe très puissante. Alors là, il y a beaucoup d'émotions, mais est-ce que ça va durer au vu de l'ampleur des budgets euh, que nous avons refusé jusqu'à présent de consacrer à ces sujets et qu'il va falloir consacrer. Et deuxième question très rapide, l'Union européenne, l'intégration de l'Ukraine dans l'Union européenne. Ce sujet n'a pas été mentionné, on l'a euh, admis. Euh, on sait tous quelle est la réalité de l'économie et des institutions ukrainiennes. Euh, nous nous sommes engagés dans une promesse politique dont on voit bien qu'elle est absolument incontournable, mais elle est-elle est réalisable Or, cette intégration fait partie inévitablement d'une vision de moyen long terme de notre relation avec euh, l'Est de l'Europe. Thank you so much. Microphone is coming all the way. I'm going to get everyone in, I promise. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Hervé Mariton, uh, two quick comments and a question. Uh, there's uh, unanimity in Europe in uh, supporting Ukraine, uh, and this will be helped by the good qualification of events. I would react to the fact that uh, events have been qualified by one of the members of the panel as genocide, for example. Is there a war crime on the scene? Uh, alas, yes, obviously, and this has to be condemned. Is there humanitarian crime? This can be discussed. Is there a genocide? I do not believe that qualifying events this way helps supporting European unanimity uh, in the uh, situation. This is the first point. The second comment, when you alluded to Solzhenitsyn, if I may, uh, Solzhenitsyn never denied the existence of Ukraine as an independent state. He just said that probably this would be a difficult period, that there might be war, and that he would oppose his sons participating in the war. That is what he precisely wrote, if I may say. The question is, particularly from a French point of view, uh, but it goes beyond. Uh, as the panel uh, emphasized, uh, the war has made the penny about NATO drop. For the French, for example, uh, NATO was very often denied. French politicians uh, talking about uh, defense and defense in Europe very seldom uh, spoke about NATO, just as if France did not belong to NATO, actually. And now the penny has dropped, and I believe this is a good thing. But as to Europe, and 
Hubert Hedrin uh, emphasized that the panel is supposed to be about the future. Uh, I would uh, ask the panel how they uh, value the present situation, for example, when uh, you've got a Franco-German uh, corporation on SCAF, and uh, just about the same time an important announcement is made on this, you've got the Italian, British, Japanese uh, corporation on a competitor to SCAP, for example. So Europe seems to be united presently, but if we look to the future, the uh, division in Europe on industrial issues and others regarding security seem to be just as strong as ever. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, moving the mic along, yes, please go ahead. D'accord. Si vous permettez, je vais parler en français. Je voudrais poser une question à Hubert Védrine à partir de, de ce débat intéressant. Je crois que dans cette guerre, certainement, la Russie qui a agressé euh, l'Ukraine va sortir affaiblie. Même si elle est européenne de culture, il y, a une, il y aura une rupture de confiance entre l'Europe et la Russie. Et la Russie, de plus en plus, va se déployer vers l'Asie, l'Inde et la Chine et les autres. Alors pour moi, est-ce que ça n'est pas une opportunité, bien sûr, pour l'Europe D'une part, de s'intégrer, de se renforcer, d'avoir une politique stratégique commune, etc. Mais d'autre part, surtout, pour moi, de s'intéresser à son autre géographie, c'est-à-dire le Sud, à la nécessité pour l'Europe de se réconcilier avec le monde arabe et avec l'Afrique. C'est avec ce monde qu'elle va pouvoir même gérer peut-être sa transition, toutes ses transitions, les transitions énergétiques entre autres, en dehors du fait qu'elle a intérêt que le problème du développement et de la Méditerranée soit résolu. Merci. Thank you so much. I think the young gentleman right next to you had a question. We'll get him the microphone. Can I see a show of hands? Whom am I missing here? Right here in the first row. And then the young gentleman. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, while she's getting the mic. Thank you very much. I think it's quite telling to see that only French speakers are talking about European defense and independence indeed. And it's quite disheartening actually to see that Germany, for instance, is pouring billions of dollars into American fighter jets, although other opportunities are available in Europe, not just mentioning the Rafale. But in, in fact, is it just because we listen too much to the goal that as French people, we dream of a European independence or does it translate into English as well? That's probably a question for the foreign speakers here in the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Uh, Dania Khatib, I have mostly a comment more than a question, and I want to make an analogy between Germany and Russia. For following uh, First World War and Germany, when Germany was humiliated and was plunging in hyperinflation, this led to the rise of a belligerent figure like Hitler. Where in, after Second World War, when Germany was treated with respect and we had the Marshall Plan, we had a peaceful, prosperous Germany. Uh, so, I mean, this is a great panel, but I don't see uh, like the Russian perspective. I speak a lot with Russians and they have a lot of grievances. They were promised, if you talk to a Russian, they, he will tell you uh, Gorbachev was promised the moon, uh, you know, that if he will gonna dissolve the Soviet Union, we're gonna have prosperity and, but all this resulted in sweet lies. So, uh, all what I'm saying, I hope that Ukraine will win, but I also, I hope that Russia, after that, I go back to Stephen's question, will be treated with respect, with humility, just in order not to have Putin 2.0, because a defeat of Russia doesn't mean it's going to become more peaceful. Thank yeah. you. Th thank you okay. so much. I, I believe, unless I have overlooked anything, I believe we have everyone here. Everybody will get their share, being mindful of uh, the time, of course. Uh, Peter, why don't you kick it off and then yeah. we'll, we'll get everyone in here for the one last round. So thank, thanks for that really uh, great set of questions. I'm, I'm a, and comments, so I'm trying to 
uh, uh, pick some of them. And, and, of course, and, and, those and, pertaining, yeah, everybody, exactly. everybody pertaining so actually, to their field. The, 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 the first question, the last one, were actually referring to um, how to deal with Russia after the war, w once it's over. So what's the future in our relation with that, with that huge country? with these um, many, many millions of, of Russians. Look, I mean, Russia is a, is a, is, is a proud nation with a lot of history, tradition, um, and we had good relationships before that. But matter of fact is the um, change through trade concept approach that we tried with the hand reached out uh, didn't work out. Um, Putin's Russia betrayed the world, and they were like free riding on that. Yeah, so there were stupid mistakes, and that had been alluded to earlier, that we did, especially in Germany, to, to increase our dependency, especially when it comes to, to Russian oil and gas. Um, so, so, I mean, obviously there needs to be a future relationship with Russia. This, the, the country, and its people especially, cannot be ignored. Uh, we need to have something, I, I hate to say, I hate to use that, that, that term, but for lack of a better one, is, we need something like an off-ramp, and I'm not talking to, to, uh, uh, with regard to Vladimir Putin, but for the nation, for the country, for the people of Russia, which I have respect for. But, you know, it's way too early, and now I try to connect that with the, the first question, with the, with the last one. This is absolutely not the time to talk about respect, treat, you know, respectful treatment of Russia. Absolutely. They are the aggressors. And... Um, Russia is, you know, I, in the beginning we talked about, uh, in the beginning of the war, we talked about, well, it's, it's Putin's war. But as has been said on the panel earlier, it's not only Putin's war, he gets a lot of support. It's, it's Russia against Ukraine and the rest of the world, basically. So I think uh, we should not give, I should totally disagree, to give Russia, any representative of Russia, a platform on this conference or any other uh, at this point in time to, you know, lobby for themselves, they have to first stop that war. And then, then we could talk about re respectful treatment, of, uh, about an off-ramp, and about all else. Stop that war, and then it's only the time to do that. Um, and I would, uh, there, was an, uh, there, was a, there was a question and a comment with regard to rearmament of Europe. If that would be realistic, um, taking into account the uh, uh, the defense investment pledge, that which means that by the time of 2024, NATO member states should increase their uh, budget, uh, 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 defense budget, um, uh, to 2% at least uh, of GDP. You know, it, it, you know being, being from Germany, a German parliamentarian, there was a lot of things that we did not do in the past, especially during the term of uh, President Donald Trump. We were heavily criticized by not doing enough. And, um, on the merits, he was right. But just the style was not really uh, good. Um, we increased our defense budgets, uh, budgets over those uh, past several years tremendously, tremendously, really, by, by uh, at least 50%. And we are stepping up to that. And um, I, I, we are fully committed to reach that 2% goal and keep that. German Chancellor, who is not from my party, but during his speech that I mentioned earlier on the 27th of February, said very clearly, very clearly, from now on, each and every year, Germany will spend 2% of its GDP just for defense, uh, uh, for, for the defense budget. So from my perspective and from a German perspective, uh, let there be no doubt that we will live up to our commitments that we met, also for our own security interests, but also as a commitment uh, uh, as a, to, to our partners with NATO as a reliable partner. And it's very clear from your words that obviously this goes beyond uh, a party being in power or in opposition. This is a unified yeah. German position, stance, and stern and frank words about uh, Russia there, uh, certainly. <coughs> uh, Bogdan, everybody is going to uh, chime in here before we wrap up. Bog Bogdan uh, Klitsch, go, go ahead. Some of the questions. Steve, frankly speaking, uh, <laughs> there was a great wisdom after the Second World War that was uh, focused in uh, one sentence beginning with uh, keeping Americans in. I would say that because uh, we witness right now the first uh, full-scale war in Europe after 1949, 
we should refer to this uh, wording, and my very short answer for your question would be to keep Americans in, Russians down, and make the European Union more stronger. Let's think in those categories. Secondly, when you mentioned uh, um, sadly about, uh, about the necessity of uh, reinforcement of the European uh, pillar within NATO, I keep in mind the famous uh, concept of European security and defense identity, ESDI. That according to my understanding of the history is completely outdated. Because uh, after ESDI was uh, put aside, there was a great beginning of European security and defense policy. Once again, began in 1998 <coughs> after the meeting of Tony Blair and uh, Jacques Chirac. And now we have at our disposal within the European Union common security and defense policy with uh, uh, plenty of instruments, several uh, uh, tools that can be used in a variety of situations, in a variety of uh, options. The problem is still with, uh, uh, with, uh, with funding those tools and with, uh, from time to time, the lack of political will to use them. If we use everything that was uh, included into the Lisbon Treaty, all our achievements after 2017, European Defence Fund, uh, Mechanism Card, uh, 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 other, uh, other uh, tools, EDA. we will be able to be much more effective by the European Union than concentrating on reinforcement of the European pillar within NATO. I don't want to under, undermine the necessity of, uh, let's say, better uh, involvement of European partners within NATO. I'm in favor of reinforcement of CSDP within the European Union and better collaboration between NATO and the European Union in the sense of both declarations from 2016 and from 2018 that created a new framework for the cooperation between those two organizations. Uh, as for the genocide, we discussed that uh, in Europe. If uh, what we witness in Ukraine is or is not genocide, I'm I'm convinced that theoretically and practically in several places in Ukraine, we observe genocide. And when you go to Borodyanka, for example, in, and in this small city, you see five buildings. Three of them were hit because they were of, uh, how to say in, in English, uh, baton pieces, you know, and those pieces, you know, were easier to destroy. And those uh, who were built, uh, that were built of bricks, were not destroyed, was not, were not uh, hit because of uh, uh, this first category of buildings, when hit, it, were easier to murder more people inside. Is it a genocide or not? Is it only a war crime or not? It is a complex extermination of the nation. It is an ideology of the extermination of the nation, theoretically and practically. And let's not forget about that. But even when we don't, uh, uh, if there are controversies con concerning that, mm -hmm. there is one crime that is not assessed and that should be tried by the special tribunal. And this is the, tri the crime of aggression. That's why, together with my colleagues from various parliaments, uh, I mean the uh, chiefs of uh, 
Foreign Affairs and European Union committees, <coughs> we call on European governments to create the special tribunal to assess the crime of aggression by Vladimir Putin and his uh, inner circle. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hubert Vedrin, so, some of the questions were addressed to you directly uh, and uh, President uh, uh, I'm going to come to you, of course, as well as I will to Zaki, being mindful of the time. Go ahead. Alors, je vais réagir très rapidement à la première et à la dernière question me concernant. Sur la première question, l'avenir, je crois que c'était Steve, contre ou avec la Russie. L'esprit de défense a été réveillé euh, en Europe par Poutine. Et donc, la réponse est évidemment contre la Russie. Donc la, la défense de l'Europe est réveillée dans le cadre de l'OTAN par Poutine contre la Russie. Il viendra peut-être un moment, enfin certainement un moment, mais je ne sais pas quand, <coughs> dans un certain temps, il faudra repenser la sécurité avec la Russie comme voisin. Et j'espère qu'à ce moment-là, l'Occident réussira à surmonter son manichéisme, qui est fondamental en Occident, pour avoir la même audace, la même intelligence, la même efficacité stratégique que les grands dirigeants américains de l'époque de la guerre froide, avant l'époque du triomphalisme. Mais ce n'est pas pour maintenant, c'est après et après-demain, je ne sais pas quand. Donc d'abord contre, puis après. Je ne dis pas ce que je souhaite, je dis ce que j'analyse par rapport à ça. À mon avis, en termes de pilier européen, puisque Zaki employait l'expression, euh, ça a reculé. Ce n'est pas une opportunité maintenant, c'est une question qui se reposera après, quand les Européens se poseront des questions sur la, la force et la durabilité de l'engagement américain. Ça, c'est la première question. Mais il faut y travailler. Il y a des éléments, il y a des procédures, il y a des outils. Mais je parle mentalement. Hein. On voit bien ce qu'est l'opinion européenne d'aujourd'hui. Et cette table ronde le montre, d'ailleurs. Sur la question de Fatalouel Alou, opportunité pour l'Europe de s'intéresser au sud, en reprenant l'ancien langage. Je, ne le sens, je le souhaite énormément et je ne le sens pas du tout. Les Européens ne sont pas du tout dans cette phase. Ils sont complètement réoccidentalisés à l'ancienne, à cause des décisions aberrantes de Poutine, mais c'est comme ça. Ils n'ont pas la capacité, ils ne peuvent même pas l'imaginer. Et comme ils sont donc redevenus manichéens suite à l'agression de Poutine, euh, ils ne sont pas capables d'imaginer par rapport aux 40 pays qui n'ont pas condamné la Russie, alors que l'agression est évidente, 40 pays représentant 60% de l'humanité, ils ne sont pas capables d'imaginer une, une politique correspondant à cette, à cette question par rapport aux nouveaux non-alignés. Je pense qu'ils le faudraient, mais ils ne vont pas réagir comme ça. Ils vont essayer de harceler les, les non-alignés de reproches moraux, juridiques, politiques, mais je ne crois pas que l'Europe d'aujourd'hui, au sein de laquelle vers une bataille d'influence demain, entre Pologne, Ukraine, France, Allemagne, etc., et tous les autres, je ne crois pas qu'elle soit capable de penser cette politique-là. Et à mon avis, ça va être une nouvelle occasion stratégique manquée. Je regrette d'avoir à dire ça, mais c'est comme ça que je sens les choses, en, des, en dépit des efforts énormes de beaucoup d'Européens. Bon, je regrette d'avoir à dire ça. <rire> Thank you. President Elbector, your final remarks, and then, Mr. Zaki, you're going to get the final word. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, I think since the start of this war, millions of Russian people actually protested against this war. You know, Putin and the Russian people are two different things. Also, with the start of this war, Putin brought big loss in Russia, economic loss, military loss, most importantly, confidence loss in Russia. And that's a very b bad thing. Also, one thing I would like to brought uh, to enlighten, because you know that mobilization, Russian mobilization, uh, are now more focused. There are more forceful mobilization for ethnic minorities in Russia. Disproportionate ethnic minorities are mobilized to the war in Russia. Most of them originally, origin from the Mongol dissidents, you know, Buryats, Kalmyk, and others mobilized disproportionately uh, to this war. Putin is killing Ukrainians in Ukraine, 
But in Russia, Putin is uh, killing ethnic minorities in Russia. Putin is using ethnic minorities like a cannon fodder. We have to pay to this attention. This is very, very, very important issue. Also, uh, with the start of mobilization, we opened our border to the ethnic minorities, to the people from Russia, to Mongolia. We have a big border with Russia. We received thousands of people from Russia. And I think if there is one less man with gun against Ukraine, I think that's also a great contribution for the peace in Russia. And uh, after this uh, war, there will be big uh, kind of the development and uh, big change going to be in Russia. And I think that's still happening in the mindset of people, not only outside of Russia, also inside of Russia. You know, to be part of the Russia or how to, how to deal with these consequences of war. And that, that is indeed the, the, the uh, very important question Steve alerted to it. Of course, not only what the future of the European Union will look like, but what the future of Russia will look like once this war is over. On, is the, on the last point on the European Union, I think European Union is greatest project which we have our humanity. I think after war, this is the test for European Union. I think after this war, European Union will be more united, more stronger, and uh, also other parts of the world should follow the suit. Yeah. For example, in Asia, we have a 48 United Nations members. We have yeah. not such establishment like in Europe, for example. Yeah. Now, uh, myself and right. other people are contemplating idea to put kind of the Council of Asia idea, you know? Yeah. How, how about how, how to find kind of consolidation in Asia? Right. In Europe, there are almost uh, yeah, 50 years that consolidation and it will be more stronger. So Great Europe program. will be more yeah. stronger is an outsider uh, perspective, something exactly lady that I'm sure you uh, uh, would attest to. Okay, uh, uh, take it away. I've made my uh, first presentation in English for the sake of uh, Francophonie. I will uh, give my answers in uh, French. Bon, sur la Russie, sur la Russie, l'avenir de la Russie, l'avenir la, de la Russie, il dépend d'abord de la Russie. Il dépend d'abord de la Russie. Fondamentalement, quel est le problème de la Russie C'est le renoncement à son identité impériale, au profit d'une identité plus nationale. Je vous invite, si vous ne l'avez pas fait, à lire un article remarquable qui a été écrit il y a plus de 20 ans par un art russe qui s'appelait Alexander Liebed, dans lequel il a clairement poser les termes de l'avenir de la Russie entre une identité nationale déterminée par les frontières de la fédération russe et une identité impériale. Tant que la Russie, tant que la Russie ne fera pas ce travail de rupture, elle aura des problèmes et nous aurons des problèmes avec elle. Alors on va me dire mais c'est très difficile. Mais oui, c'est très difficile. Mais oui, c'est très difficile. Moi, je discute avec, euh, mon, avec euh, Borel tous les jours de ces questions et il me dit, tu sais, pour l'Espagne, la perte de Cuba a été une terrible tragédie. Mais oui, mais oui. La perte de l'Algérie a été pour la France aussi une tragédie. Mais l'Espagne, comme la France, s'en sont sortis en renonçant à leur projet impérial. Il faudra bien qu'un jour, la Russie fasse cet effort qu'elle n'a pas réussi à faire, probablement, probablement à cause de la nature de son régime. Et de toute façon, il n'y a pas que l'Ukraine, il y a ce qui se passe en Asie centrale, où on voit très très bien la volonté de, euh, se, de sortir de l'orbite russe, peut-être pour entrer dans l'orbite chinoise, je ne sais pas s'ils gagneront au change, enfin bon, c'est la dynamique. Donc c'est le passage d'une identité impériale à une identité nationale. Bon, pour ce qui est de la défense européenne, écoutez, moi je reviens de Washington, où nous avons euh, tous les ans un dialogue entre l'Union européenne et les États-Unis sur la Chine au plus haut niveau euh, euh, américain. 
Et très clairement, très clairement, les Américains nous disent « Il faut que vous consentiez un effort militaire beaucoup plus important, que vous soyez beaucoup plus autonome, car c'est vrai que pour nous, nous allons et nous avons d'autres priorités. » Donc ce n'est pas être contre l'OTAN, ce n'est pas contre les États-Unis avec lesquels fondamentalement nous avons les mêmes valeurs, quoi qu'on en dise, mais l'Europe, qu'on le veuille ou non, devra être la garante de sa sécurité avec le soutien des États-Unis. Et heureusement, d'ailleurs, puisqu'aujourd'hui, et le chef d'état-major français l'a dit, que s'il y avait aujourd'hui une guerre de haute intensité, l'armée française, qui est la plus puissante d'Europe, ne tiendrait pas plus de dix jours. Bon, donc le soutien américain, il est absolument essentiel. Mais quand moi je parle d'autonomie ou de responsabilité stratégique, j'ai en tête, et je pense que nous sommes certains à en voir en tête, une idée qui consiste à dire qu'il faut que nous apprenions à penser par nous-mêmes notre propre avenir, notre propre sécurité. Et pas contre les Américains, pas contre les États-Unis, mais penser par nous-mêmes, parce que personne ne pensera à nous-mêmes, à notre place. Et si on le fait, ce n'est pas pour la bonne cause. Bien, troisième point. Un, uh, we, we have to wrap up, unfortunately. Yeah, 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 but so, just 60, one, one second. 60 seconds, uh, so we can wrap sur, up the session. Sur, sur le sud, euh, et là, je ne serai pas tout à fait d'accord avec ce que vient de dire Hubert, en ce sens que, et je peux vous donner des exemples de ce que l'on a vécu euh, depuis le début de la crise en Ukraine, avec l'Afrique, notamment, où il y a eu un formidable travail de désinformation russe, mais inimaginable, destiné à rendre l'Europe responsable de la crise alimentaire. Bon, qu'est-ce que nous avons fait Le représentant, il a envoyé une lettre à, aux 52 ministres africains des affaires étrangères, dans laquelle il leur a expliqué que les céréales n'étaient absolument pas couvertes par les sanctions, et il leur a dit « si vous avez des problèmes, notamment de « overcompliance » qui se pose, adressez-vous à nous, nous avons ouvert une ligne, euh, une hotline, et euh, nous avons euh, réglé un certain nombre de problèmes. Mais on ne peut pas accepter yeah. l'idée qu'un qu qu ministre, je ne serai right. pas africain, dise yeah. à, à Borrell, euh, les, ce sont les sanctions qui sont responsables de la crise, no. et quand on lui a dit qui est responsable, okay. qui vous a dit ça, il nous dit c'est Poutine. Voilà. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the future of Europe and European security after Ukraine. Uh, I think I speak for all when I say this is a subject matter. We could s sit here until 8 p.m. and probably still not have covered all aspects. But I think you would agree that this, this uh, panel, in, in a very splendid manner, managed uh, to give us a very content-rich debate, so which I'm sure will also uh, be used for the discussion with uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba later on throughout the day. And uh, the 8 a.m. session on any given day, Song Nim, is never an easy task. So just for that, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. Thank you so much. <laughs>